So my guest today is just one of those people who show that everything really does happen for a reason. See you just now. Hello to you and welcome to Visionaries. You know, sometimes our struggles can really help us to discover our purpose. Our guest today used her loss to help save hundreds of abandoned children. Dee Blackie joins us to tell us exactly how she did that. Dee, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to Visionaries. Thank you so much for having me. You're originally a Cape Tonian? Yes, Which I grew part up, of Cape Town? I grew up in uh, sort of Runnebosch Newlands, uh -huh. uh, just down the road from the cricket grounds. Oh my goodness, yeah. with mom yeah. and dad. Absolutely. And yeah. did you go watch cricket much? You know, we used to go because we used to go and uh, grab all the Coca-Cola bottles and go uh, whilst people were watching yeah. and go and get the um, money back from the store. So it was a great way to... Um, oh my, why did I think <laughs> of that? So yeah, that was, uh, that was most of the time. I wasn't watching the cricket. I was uh, exchanging Coke bottles for... Uh, <laughs> Typical entrepreneurs, Because you know? both your mom and your dad were entrepreneurs. Absolutely. Tell us more. So uh, my mom was a squash player. Um, she, uh, in fact, was number two in the world in her day, oh. amazing squash player. And uh, she, when she stopped playing professional squash, she, uh, was, she used to coach squash. And she had a whole school of squash for the whole of the Western Cape. And then after that, she ran a number of squash uh, courts. And uh, so we used to run company leagues and those sorts of things and, uh, and various tournaments. Um, and of course, we used, my sister and I used to help her do that. Yes. And we used to do lots of squash coaching and also tennis coaching at various schools around the country, or around, the, around the province. Yeah. And then my dad was an accountant. Oh, there's you and your mom. Right? Yes, yes, yes. That's my mom and I. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. And, and your dad? Accountant, you my just My dad mentioned. was an accountant, yes. but he had his own small practice. Uh -huh. And he had a practice in Cape Town and another one in Hermanus. I think that he, so that he could escape um, my mom, my sister <laughs> and I once a week and go and play golf. <laughs> but, he, he uh, say, I'm, I'm in the Hermanus office. Exactly. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> very strategic. Yeah, no, absolutely. And tell me about your sister. So my sister now runs our family business, which um, a few years uh, sort of down from the squash playing and so on, um, my mom sort of realized that uh, uh, people couldn't afford um, full-time you know, help in the home mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, so she started a window cleaning company and it started with um, four guys and herself yeah. and a bucky and some ladders. And they're now the biggest window cleaning company in the Western Cape, My commercial goodness. and domestic. Yeah. My goodness. So we all ended up, that was about 30 years ago. So now we, we all ended up working for her at some point. And uh, my sister now runs that business. My goodness. Yeah. So you and her were doing the filing and, and all of that during the school holidays. And, and uh, <laughs> driving, driving people around, are, driving uh, window cleaners around and, uh, and washing a few windows. <laughs> <laughs> on occasion. Yourselves as well. Yeah, absolutely. Busy, busy. But also um, learned a lot about sales. So mm. in our holidays, we could earn extra money by um, going and selling contracts uh, to, you know, various businesses going inside saying, we're looking at your windows. There's a beautiful view. You can't see out. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, and, and we used to, so, so I learned a lot about sales and marketing, I must say, in those early days. Sounds um, like it was a happy, busy childhood. Absolutely. A mm. very, very loving and supportive um, uh, growing up experience, I must yeah. say. Yeah. It, it, it's a pity because I, I, I read that at school, you didn't enjoy, you know, having that experience as much as you did at home. You struggled no. a bit there. Tell yeah. me about that. Um, so I, I really struggled with, mm. um, I was diagnosed dyslexic, um, but I think that's because all that was available for diagnosis in those days. Now that I look at, um, uh, I'm actually studying um, learning disabilities and developmental disorders now, and I, and I look at it and I realize that I was probably significantly dyslexic, ADHD, and a whole range of other challenges, but I just did not fit into the school system. Oh. So I pretty much failed my way through school yeah. and um, and the result was uh, being told that I was naughty and stupid was that I then became rather naughty and stupid. <laughs> yeah, because it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Absolutely. I mean, the more you hear it, the more you believe it, yeah. the more you act it out. Yeah. It must have been very frustrating though. It was um, because I knew I had good ideas and I knew that I had lots of stories to tell. Uh, but they weren't the stories that the school wanted to hear. Mm. And so um, I ca got caught up in movies and television, and I still believe all life's great questions are answered in the movies. <laughs> and, um, and that became my, my other world, my world that I escaped to. 
interesting though is that when you went to university and you did what you loved and the environment became conducive towards you learning and growing you excelled you I mean you passed with distinction yeah I mean I think everyone was quite surprised um, there I was dyslexic couldn't spell um, you know read very slowly and uh, but wanted to study to become a journalist yeah. and uh, mostly because I wanted to be a, a journalist for National Geographic mm -hmm. um, the idea of going into the sort of wilderness and and observing gorillas and chimps and animals and talking about them was my absolute dream so I always wanted to get to Rhodes University which at the time was the only university that offered journalism and thankfully my parents realized this passion and they literally sent me to a college in matric so that I would pass matric sufficiently but once I got to university because I was doing what I loved yes. um, I I can't say I excelled straight away it took a while to get my confidence up but when I did start passing exams and then doing quite well in them and mm. especially a lot of the more practical projects and essays that I could research and spend my time doing then I did do I did do well yeah <laughs> and you also met your hubby in yes, <laughs> love of my life. You love at first sight? <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Like a movie. Yeah, no, pretty much across the crowded room. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened? Did he come to you? Did um, you say, Yeah, we just, um, you know, we, we met each other um, initially and he was very shy and then he disappeared off for a gap year. He went to row in Paris for a year and, um, and then he came back and um, I hadn't seen him in a year and he hadn't seen me and uh, it really was... Love at first sight. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> or second sight. <laughs> I love that. I yeah. love that. Okay, I want to hear more. We're going to leave it there for the time being. Okay. When we come back, we talk about Dee's professional life. And I mean, she began to do amazing things, working on uh, brand and strategy and marketing for the likes of SAB Miller. Uh, there's also, remind me very quickly, which is the other big um, one? Holland, MTN. MTN. Yes, I know um, there was MTN there Most as well. of the large banks yeah. in the country, most of the last cell phone, large cell phone companies in love the country, it. I've done their strategies. Yeah. Love it. We hear more about that in just a moment. Don't you go anywhere. Welcome back and thank you very much for staying with us. Now, just before the break, my guest, Dee, was just talking a bit about her struggles in her formative years and how that all changed once she found her passion and was studying towards what she enjoyed, which was journalism. She goes into corporate and experiences resounding success as well. I want you to pick up there, Dee, and just tell us about how it was, you know, doing something that you love and for once not hearing the, you're stupid, you can't learn, but in fact, you were, you know, in high demand. Yeah. Well, I think the interesting thing about people who um, have different kinds of brains, who are wired slightly differently, mm -hmm. is that you do think differently. And so um, my job was to come up with brand positioning and vision statements and, and things that really differentiated brands in the market. And uh, I remember a lot of people saying to me, how did you think about that uh, that way? And I was like, well, how else could you think about it? <laughs> so there was an advantage to thinking differently mm -hmm. about the world and seeing things differently. Um, and that advantage came in in creating new ideas and creating new brands. Mm. But at, at the height of that c success and, and, and your career, you also had a struggle that I, I don't know if you were able to articulate to many people around you, at least not in corporate. You had not one, not two, not three, seven miscarriages. Yeah. I can't even begin to imagine what that was, must have been like. I must say, I think um, the thirties for a woman is a really tough time. Yeah. You're trying to establish your career. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you are running large businesses, which I was at the time. Um, it, extensive travel across the continent and overseas. And, uh, and also trying to buy houses and set up families and so on and have babies. And unfortunately, my body just struggled. And uh, so I'm very blessed. I have two beautiful children. Mm. Um, but in between, I did have seven different miscarriages. And, um, and yeah, there's, there's nothing anyone can really say to anyone who's had a miscarriage. It's devastating. And uh, it brings about a huge sense of loss and mm. failure mm. and shame and all the things that, and guilt that maybe you did something wrong mm. that caused this. And, and it doesn't matter how many times people say, well, you're lucky, at least you're falling pregnant. You're lucky you've got two beautiful children. Um, it still is devastating. Mm. And then on top of that, my last miscarriage, I ended up getting postpartum depression, which was really knocked me <laughs> for a six. I, um, I remember before, I, I was usually quite dis always quite dismissive of people who really struggle with mental illness, with depression. Mm. You know, I was one of those people who would say, you know, pick yourself up, yeah. you'll be okay. 
And then it happened to me and I realized how you, you honestly do fall into a big dark hole and you, you are full of adrenaline and no, absolutely no serotonin. You, you, you honestly don't want to face the day and you don't think anybody else understands or wants to be near you. And for somebody who's generally quite happy and upbeat, I spent most of my days crying, mm. which was really tough, especially with two very young children at the time. Mm. How did you pick yourself up from that? How did you get through it? I mean, I think I had um, an incredibly supportive family. Mm -hmm. Again, um, my husband was incredible um, there for me. Um, and I took some time out. Yeah. I, uh, I really just needed some a break mm -hmm. and to get back to what was important for me. So 2010, I, um, I, 2009 was the depression year. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then 2010 was a break year, which was an amazing year to take a break and spend lots of time with my kids yeah. because it was World Cup year. So the kids were on holiday for most of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, we made maca wrappers. Mm -hmm. We learned how to do the disky <laughs> dance. We did all oh. the important things that you do. We went even went to a soccer match together, wow. uh, which was just amazing. And so it really was an incredible year and just time for me to breathe which i think yeah. was really important refuel reflect yeah and now tell me about that moment that critical moment where you're reading a newspaper you're going through what you're going through you know in the midst of trying to conceive you then see that other people are able to conceive and just abandon their children for mm. whatever reason and mm. i'm not judging but i'm just saying the act of just leaving this vulnerable mm. little one uncared for when you read that what happens to you at that point? Well, I mean, it was horrifying. It was the middle of winter, it was July. It was freezing cold. And I remember thinking, and I saw this picture on the front page of the Times newspaper. And it was of a little girl who had just been born. Her umbilical cord was still attached. And she'd been left on a rubbish heap outside, um, on a dump outside Soweto. And um, yeah, d there was a piece of toilet paper next to her, like a roll of toilet paper, and she'd been partially burnt and she was dead. Mm. And I remember it was the most horrific thing, and I remember being horrified. Um, here I was desperate because I'd lost so many babies mm. and would have done anything to keep them. And we were, and I was living in a country where people were disposing of their babies. Yeah. So I was righteously furious and devastated. Um, but of that changed, I must say, that uh, my feelings towards the women um, who make this desperate choice, yeah. um, who have nobody else to, to I, was, I had all of this happen to me, all of my experiences in an incredibly supportive environment. Mm. And, um, and, you know, later on doing research into the issue of child abandonment, realizing that before anyone abandons a child, they've been abandoned by everyone. They've been abandoned by their families. They've been abandoned by their partners. They've been abandoned yeah. by the state. And so they're making survival decisions. So yes, I was <laughs> righteously furious, yeah. um, but it spurred me into action. And it made me realize that I needed to do something about this because you know, I always say in child protection, which is my world now, we spend our lives stuck in shock and denial. Mm. I can't believe that happened. Well, it's not me. It's not my community. It's not my family. I can't believe this happened. It's not me. And so we ping pong between these two things and we don't take that next step, which is to say, it's happening. Why is it happening? What can we do about it? How can we change behavior to actually make sure that it doesn't happen again? I want to find out what did you do about it in just a moment. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to also know what happens thereafter, make sure you stay with us. again if you've just joined us you're right on time to find out what our guest Dee Blackie did about the problem that she encountered when she just saw that far too many children were being abandoned in this country she chose not to look away but get actively involved Dee tell me a little bit about your intervention so it started off with just engaging with the child protection community and um, I facilitated a, a large and uh, set up and facilitated a large conference in 2011 and we started a national adoption coalition for South Africa. And the reason why adoption is because if you have a child and you don't know who their biological family is, they've literally been abandoned on a street corner or in a uh, taxi rank or in a toilet. Um, 
then the best long-term solution for that child is for them to grow up in a family mm -hmm. and that's why adoption um, obviously if we know who the family is and we can try family reunification we certainly will but um, for those children it's much better to grow up in a family than to grow up in an institution and in a children's home agreed and where does courage your organization <laughs> come into the picture so the first thing I did was I created a huge campaign, being in marketing, um, where we started talking about, uh, with a whole bunch of wonderful agencies, where we talked about the, the benefits of adoption, adoption being an act of love, placing your child up for adoption, being an act of love. We also uh, created a huge campaign called Choose to Care, mm -hmm. which was all about choosing uh, around crisis pregnancy and, and choosing to um, place your child up for yeah. um, adoption as opposed to abandoning your child. Um, but very quickly I realized that um, there was something going on there. There was, there was a cultural issue around adoption that was problematic. Mm -hmm. Most of the blocks that we, I encounter when approaching communities is that they are very scared that the child they're going to be adopting or fostering comes from a different culture, particularly with our black community. And people get very scared when they think that they won't know what to do with this child, which culture the child is going to fall into. Two imperatives, children want to belong, number one, and number two, children need a voice. And the voice will come first and foremost from their family, from their parents, whoever those parents might be. These children need to belong if they are to grow and develop. They need a permanent place that they call home. And so I decided to go back to university and I did my master's in anthropology, which is the study of culture and the social. Uh -huh. And wait, I looked, wait, how, yeah. how long ago was this? Uh, so this was in 2013, 2014. And when last were you in varsity? 20 years before that. Oh my goodness, <laughs> so after 20 years you went back to yes. university. Yeah. Yes. And uh, yeah, so I did my master's and it focused on um, the experience of child abandonment and adoption in the context of African ancestral beliefs. Mm -hmm. Because I realized that there were these social challenges, these cultural challenges around um, the courts making decisions on how families are made as opposed to families making decisions. This is Haniel. He's now 10 months. Haniel, he's <laughs> and they gave the child up for adoption. So as I said, lo, unyana wait. Which means, was ego of any kind, culture, belief, nobody in don't religion, nobody in don't is about a ne, ya lapa gote kai. You understand? Because na ye, ukula eng unyan, utza titata gum. By the time he's five, six, all he knows is us two. And I spoke to everybody involved in the the crisis that is child abandonment so mm -hmm. i spoke to mothers who'd abandoned children who'd been abandoned uh, the doctors nurses social workers police officers community members who sort of rallied around them when the abandonment took place um, the adopting parents the foster care parents the children's homes and then also to the psychologists psychiatrists and sangomas and youngers who dealt with the child who'd been abandoned or the mother who had all f uh, who had abandoned the child and uh, and all father who have ad had abandoned the child um, and really just asked them about that experience and it was really interesting and it gave me an enormous amount of insight into not just crisis pregnancy and child abandonment, but the broad range of child protection challenges yeah. that were taking place um, in many of our communities in South Africa. Now she knows that I'm the mother. It's very difficult when I think that day she's going to leave me and go to other, but she must go to them, to her mother, to her biological mother. What's so interesting and what my research taught me was that child abandonment is not about the abandoning mother or the abandoned child, it's about the community. It's a societal problem. Agreed. Absolutely. Agreed. So these, the, I mean, women are falling pregnant, um, children are being abandoned, bellies are growing and then disappearing, children are disappearing and people aren't ans asking questions. And so how do we get communities empowered to start saying, well, this happened, how can we behave differently to, first of all, hopefully make sure it doesn't happen again, but also to deal with that challenge when it happens. Mm. The best way, for instance, to get a child into the child protection system as opposed to the child just floundering in without any form of identification or care, yeah. um, which often happens to children who've been abandoned. 
I love that you have used your profession and your expertise to tackle this problem. Yeah. You're doing it in terms of research, you're getting the numbers, you're asking the questions, but you also use the marketing side of things and to, to, to get our attention because sometimes we get abandonment fatigue, right? You hear so many times of the abandonment that it's just another baby, it's just another this. Yeah. So you came up with a clever, clever strategy. Tell me a little bit about this, Joel, and how you used it to raise the alarm. So um, this was just one of the campaigns that I've developed um, along the way and it was done with the National Adoption Coalition of South Africa and what we did was we created, I, I actually made, I made personally about a thousand dolls, they're little dolls made out of stockings and with a painted face and um, yeah, so ma sewed the little dolls and then wrapped them up in scraps of cloth, put them into bags and told a little story about the issue of abandonment on the bag. And then we abandoned these babies all over Johannesburg, um, in some places in Pretoria, uh, in Cape Town, in uh, Durban and in Port Elizabeth. Mm. And really what it was about saying was that, you know, you would find this baby in places where babies have been abandoned. So in toilets, uh, in pot plants, in benches, on benches, at taxi ranks, wherever. And you'd pick this up and it would say, this baby doll has been abandoned. Uh, please feel free to give him or her a loving home. Mm. And then it would tell you the crisis of abandonment, that we have three and a half thousand children being abandoned annually. That of every child abandoned who lives to die, um, mm. but that the woman who makes the decision to abandon the child is absolutely desperate. Kotlin's Baby Sanctuary cares for abused, abandoned, neglected, HIV-positive children. Our babies come from all over Gauteng, and we often find babies and children under the age of six abandoned in, in the city streets, um, in suburbs, and those are the kinds of children that we offer shelter and care for. And so really guiding people towards all of the organizations and institutions mm. that can help and support them. The other thing that I did as part of the campaign was um, I had a big petition going, really asking um, the Department of Social Development at the time to do some research on the subject. Because although I had done qualitative research, we need to know the, the numbers. We need to know where are children being abandoned, um, when are they being abandoned, how are they being abandoned. Because if we have that kind of information, we can start to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, sadly, we still haven't had that research take place, but at least through my research, we, we have an idea of, as to why people abandon, mm. and that helps us to address the issue. And I do know that a lot of child protection organizations have said that the increased awareness and their increased understanding and sensitivity around the issue yeah. has improved their um, response to abandoned children and the abandoning mother mm. and how to manage that process. Mm. This is such a heavy subject and sometimes it can be very depressing and it can be very cumbersome, I'd imagine. What do you do to switch off? So once again, I turn to my family. Mm. <laughs> my family are my rock. Um, I'm, I've got much better at self-care. Yes. Um, so when Very I'm feeling important. particularly emotional, um, I think somebody, I have a lot of people saying to me, I can't do what you do. I can't switch off my emotions and do what mm. you do. And the funny thing is I don't switch off my emotions. Yeah. I feel every single story I read about abuse, mm. abandonment, exploitation, I feel it desperately, but I'd rather be doing something about it and, and actively and be inv actively involved in finding a solution than know that it's happening and, yeah. and not do anything about it. We can't forget where we come from. We've got to create a space for our culture and our traditions. Two, we must ensure that we have a very clear vision of what we want to achieve. You know, what is our scorecard in terms of our responsibility towards our children and looking after our children? And three, ensuring that we understand this concept of sustainability and knowing that sustainability and Ubuntu, which I believe is our very unique African way of looking at sustainability, is going to be the solution is in Ubuntu. What did you say about movies again, that they're a perfect uh, reflection of reality? What was it? They're, that all life's great questions are answered in the movies. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Let me leave it yeah. there. Dee, thank you very much uh, for joining us. That's all for today, folks. We do it all over again next week. Same time, same place. Bye for now. I think the most important thing in South Africa today is, that we need to deal with is this issue of personal and community disempowerment. We need to learn how to empower ourselves and how to empower the people around us. And I think the best way to do that is through this thing called love. It's all good and well to have a vision for the future 
or to have some level of self-awareness. But until we start thinking more abundantly, that there's more than enough for everyone, that we can love each other and that we can achieve more and that we can love ourselves, I think that's the key to creating a better South Africa.